Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. This is the third part of Life Lab, our five-part series about how tiny life can change the world. In the last episode, we started packing for Mars, but planning the trip brought up some difficult questions. You should listen to that episode if you haven't already to know what we're talking about. Especially because this led us to the question we'll be attempting to answer today. How do we make the decisions that are going to affect our future as humans? All right, Marshall, we're kind of stuck on this Mars question. How can we solve it? Well, it's clear that we disagree, and one of us is right, and one of us is wrong. Probably I'm the right one. (laughs) I mean, I disagree about that, too. But ultimately, it's not us who gets to decide whether we should go to Mars. I don't know. I've got a pretty major space traveling operation going with the squirrels in our attic. (laughs) We've decided we're going. All right. Well, you and your team of squirrel astronauts can do what you will. When it comes to realistic visions of getting to Mars, the decision for humanity to settle another planet could involve literally the entire world. We have to think about how do we make sure that everybody is heard. That's Adam Arkin from our last episode, right? Yes, and he agrees that our future in space is not just up to scientists and astronauts. How do we make sure there are diverse people and diverse minds and diverse nations are taken into account as we go and establish dominance out in space? Huh, so he's saying that this shouldn't be a competition to see who can get their flag on Mars first. Exactly. It shouldn't be like the race that we did to the moon. It should be a planet-wide decision. (laughs) Are you saying we should plan it for the whole planet? Yes. We should plan the planet planning planet? (laughs) Yes, but how to make that plan is still to be decided. I don't think we've solved that problem. I think we've discussed it. I think it's been surfaced, but I don't think we've solved it yet. (laughs) And so that's something for you guys all to be involved with. You guys, like me, you, and the crack team of squirrel astronauts in our attic, I didn't know we were all invited to join the Intergalactic Council. I'm pretty sure he's not talking about me, you, and the squirrels alone. He's (laughs) saying our listeners could get involved with deciding if and how humans live on Mars. Wow, really? That's that's a huge responsibility. Right? And that got me thinking, not just about Mars, but about synthetic biology. Who gets to decide how we use it in the future? And how do you even get to decide who gets to decide? Well, Adam kind of left that up in the air. So I set aside the Mars problem, packed up my recording gear, and went to Cambridge, Massachusetts. And we'll be there right after this short break. Ooh, is that the sound of uh, Harvard-educated birds? Yes, yes it is. Hello. Hello. Sam Weiss Evans greeted me at the door in front of a steep set of steps leading to his family's apartment. Sorry, the stairs are so steep. <laughs> <laughs> Sam's not a synthetic biologist, but he works with them to help decide which technology is created and if it should be used in the real world. So, like, in the future, should we use synthetic biology to solve problems, or should we not? Exactly. So Sam had invited me over to demonstrate how to think through these tough decisions with the help of a very special guest, his eight-year-old daughter. So, do you like to be called Isabelle or Izzy? Izzy. Izzy, okay. They're going to be talking about a problem that might be solved by synthetic biology— getting rid of a deadly disease called malaria. I set Izzy and Sam up with microphones on their dining room table and got ready to listen to the conversation unfold. Ready to get started? Sure, yeah, yeah. All right, go ahead. Okay, uh, have you ever heard of malaria? Yes. What do, you, what do you know about it, anything? I know that it's passed by mosquitoes. Yeah, so when the mosquito bites you, then you might get sick. Wait, uh, can I butt in here? Yeah, we have control of the audio. You can just, like, press stop and start on the tape. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> so um, so why is malaria an issue we're talking about here? It kills hundreds of thousands of people each year, and it's a big problem in some parts of the world. 
Ugh. Yeah, mosquitoes are definitely the worst. But where does synthetic biology come in with this? We're getting to it. Let's get back to the conversation. So people have been coming up with all kinds of ideas. Well, how do we address this problem of malaria? But there's another idea that, that they're working on right now, which is to change the mosquito. How do you change a mosquito? Right? It's kind of a weird idea. Okay. I mean, that is a weird idea. So how do you change a mosquito? This is where synthetic biology comes in. The mosquito like, is a, a living being, and that living being has, you could think of it like code, like code in their body that tells them, you're going to be this kind of being, you're going to be this kind of animal, and you're going to grow one head and not two, and you're going to grow wings, and you really like blood. Yuck. <laughs> okay, so he's either talking about mosquito DNA or vampire DNA. <laughs> <laughs> He's definitely talking about mosquitoes here because mosquito DNA has all the instructions for how to be a mosquito. But in some species, it also has the instructions that let mosquitoes carry the malaria virus and pass it on to people. Those sound like some pretty bad instructions. Can we tear up that manual maybe? Well, let's hear more about this idea from Sam. The one idea might be maybe we don't want the mosquitoes to transmit malaria or... Maybe we just don't need the mosquito anymore. So what if we change the mosquito so that when the mosquitoes try to have babies, they can't have babies anymore? Mm -hmm. And so you can, like, just take the mosquitoes out of the environment. Is this a good idea? Okay, so let's pause here for a moment. Sam's just described a big idea to Izzy. That's changing the mosquito's DNA to prevent female mosquitoes from being able to have babies or reproduce. If they can't reproduce, the species will die out. No mosquito babies means no mosquitoes ever again, which means no malaria. So listeners, here's your chance to think about Sam's question yourself. Is this a good idea? That's a tough one. So we need to think about whether it's a good idea or not, and then why or why not? Yeah, take a few moments to think about it, or you can even pause the podcast to discuss it. Then we'll hear Izzy's answer. Okay, now that we've all thought about it, what what did Izzy say? No, because bats eat mosquitoes. And if there's no mosquitoes, then the bats can't eat mosquitoes. So they'll die out, and the ones that eat the bats will die out, and the ones that eat the animals who eat the bats will die out, and it'll go like that until it's the top of the food chain where nothing can eat it, and then they'll just die out, and there'll be nothing left. That's true. That's so true. Yeah. So as much as we humans really hate mosquitoes and would love for them to be gone forever, I guess Izzy did just point out that they are pretty important to bats. It's true, bats play an important role in the food chain, but maybe not all of our listeners had the same reason for saying no to changing mosquitoes as Izzy did. Or maybe they think there are other important reasons to say yes. Oh, we've got another problem here. (laughs) Like, do we have to get everybody in the world to agree which direction science should go before anybody does anything? Mm, No. No. Right. Yeah, no, that doesn't really make sense, does it? Yeah, because it would be really, really hard to get every single person in the world because you can't do that. You have to say it really, 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 really fast in a (laughs) second. (laughs) Yeah, right. Yeah, Izzy's got a really good point here. And also, people can change their minds sometimes. So is it even possible to make a good decision about science? Like, maybe we should just go with what the squirrels want to do, and that would be just as good. (laughs) Hold on. These squirrels in the attic aren't the answer to everything. I'm not going to tell them you said that. (laughs) Maybe this is a good time to step away from Sam and Izzy's dining room table for a moment and press pause on the conversation. So after my visit, I called Sam to explain a little bit more about where he was going with this. What I was trying to do in my conversation with Izzy was to show that the kids who are listening to the podcast can really have a role in saying, 
hey, science, I've got a perspective on the world that matters and that should be included in your visions of what a good future looks like. So kids' opinions really matter. Absolutely. Like, think about it. When there's a decision that affects you, whether it's at your home or at school or in your community, you want your opinion to be heard, right? That's what makes things feel fair. It's the same with science. Making decisions about science is making decisions about life. So what does Sam mean by that? Well, he's saying that even though science might have this feeling of being separate from normal life, it's really just a bunch of humans trying to work through things. We too often think that there is some like good answer in the world of science that is objective. But what I'm trying to say is in a lot of these questions, it is very much a human process. Like doing science is very much a human process. Well, so let me get this straight. He's saying that scientists aren't all superhuman geniuses who can tell us what's right and wrong. Yes, <laughs> scientists. They're just like us. And while they do have the special ability to do research and build technologies, it doesn't mean that they know inherently what's good or bad for everyone. That's something we have to think about. For me, it always makes me ask, for whom? Like, is, this is a good idea for whom? This is a bad idea for whom? So like a decision might seem awesome for me, but it has really bad consequences for somebody else. Yeah, it could. So to make a good decision, you have to figure out who might be affected by it. Well, so how do you do that? So Sam gave me an example from his own work. He told me about the time he worked with a group of scientists who were considering changing mosquito DNA to get rid of malaria on a small Caribbean island. St. John's, which is the island we were looking on, 50% of the island is a national park. The scientists started a conversation with the St. John's National Park Service about maybe releasing these modified mosquitoes in the park. They can just do whatever they want on their section of the island, which is half the island. So we could have just worked with them, released it on the, you know, in the park. And of course, it would go outside of the park. It's true. Mosquitoes really have no respect for property lines. <laughs> so they could have just had the park rangers, like, give them the thumbs up. But the rest of the island never would have had a say. Well, that doesn't seem particularly fair. But I was saying, you know, is that OK? And the scientists were like, we don't think that that's OK. And I was like, OK, we'll go talk to somebody else. Uh, I mean... I'm sure there are people who actually live there year round, right? Okay, go talk to those people. And, and so they really got a sense of the complexity of the local community. The modified mosquito debate is still going on in many parts of the world, involving scientists, governments, and local communities. It's a long process in each place. In the case of St. John's, Sam said that the scientists didn't take their project further, but they learned something important in the process. The point of the whole exercise for me with them was, was saying, you think you want to make this technology because you think it'll solve a problem in the world. But what is the problem that, that you're trying to solve and how do other people see that problem? So I guess on an island, it seems a little easier to talk to all the people who would be impacted by these decisions because there's fewer of them and it's like harder for them to get away. But how does that work when it involves like a whole country or a whole planet, like going to Mars? Will people ever agree about that? So even though you can't talk to everyone in the world, like Izzy said, scientists can talk to more people and get more opinions, including kids. And that's what science needs right now. It needs much more involvement in the processes of making decisions. And the respect for the outcome of that process will be a very different science as well as a different society. Okay, through the magic of audio, let's now transport ourselves back to Sam and Izzy's dining room table as we wrap up our conversation. So how did you feel about that conversation? I liked it. I like the bit where it's also, should we? Yeah, like, should we do this or should we not do this? Or I'm kind of in the middle. I don't know which one we should do. Yeah, or maybe we should, but... Very carefully. <laughs> or maybe we shouldn't, but very carefully. <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah. Okay, so we're back in the safety of our own studio. No genetically modified mosquitoes here, just the squirrels. 
So where do we go from here? What's next on our magical audio field trip? Well, in the next episode, we are going to talk more about making these science decisions very carefully as we explore the future of something you're probably touching right now, your clothes. It's actually interesting because fashion is one of the last places as scientists or engineers we think to innovate. We'll talk to a scientist who's making new clothing materials out of some pretty unexpected biology. Have you ever been bitten by a spider? Yes, and I do not have superpowers yet. Wow, that sounds bizarre. Are the spiders, like, manning the machines? (laughs) We'll find out next time as we explore synthetic biology in fashion. Thanks to Sam Weiss-Evans, Senior Research Fellow at the Program on Science, Technology, and Society at the Harvard Kennedy School, and Izzy Weiss-Evans. In fact, thanks to the whole family for letting me take over the dining table for an afternoon. We also heard from Chris Prather at MIT and Adam Arkin from UC Berkeley in this episode. Life Lab is supported by the Engineering Biology Research Consortium, a nonprofit committed to educating the next generation and building a community dedicated to solving big challenges with engineering biology with funding from the National Science Foundation under award number 2116166. Special thanks to Emily Orend and India Hook Barnard. You can find a transcript and other educational materials about this episode on the blog on our website, sciencepodcastforkids.com. Learn more about how Sam thinks about synthetic biology in our special bonus interview episode. It's available to Tumble patrons who pledge just a dollar or more a month on patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. Our interns on this project are Elliot Hajaj and Grace Ingram. Eric Kuhn is our engineer and mixer. Sarah Robertson-Lentz edited this series and designed the episode art. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote this episode. And I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I did all the scoring and sound design for this episode. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and join us next week for part four of Life Lab.